Welcome to A State of Mind. This is Julian Royce. I'm recording this here in my office in downtown Boulder, Colorado, where I work as a somatic therapist specializing in EMDR, as well as in ketamine, psychedelic-assisted therapy. I also work with couples and other related work, including teaching meditation and mindfulness. That's, that's a big passion of mine. It's something I love doing. Today's episode is a great one. Today we have the great, powerful Dr. Robert Love coming back on the podcast. This will be the third episode I have released with him. And it was just a treat to get to see him again. He is a neuroscientist. He's an expert on brain health. He's helping people to live longer, improve their brain health, avoid things like Alzheimer and dementia. And if you're starting to experience signs of Alzheimer's and dementia, he has ways to help you mitigate that. And he currently has 1.6 million followers on TikTok, over 250,000 followers on Instagram, and over 100 million views on social media. And that's all happened I think in the last year or two, which is just, it's amazing. It's been amazing to see. Um, and again, he specializes in helping people prevent Alzheimer's disease with science, which is such a gift to this world. It's, it's so needed. So it's great to have him on, great to hear his wisdom. One of the things that I took away from this conversation, which isn't new to me, of course, but just the importance of exercise. And as um, he shared with us in this conversation, if you look at the research, the benefits of exercise on brain health far outweighs that of any kind of supplements and that kind of thing. Now, supplements can be helpful. And um, one thing that I like to add to the conversation around health and things like supplements is a fact that continues to astound me <laughs> and something that I spend time contemplating, which is, in my understanding, looking at the scientific research and everything, the single most powerful drug substance ever discovered and studied is, drumroll, the placebo. You know, I mean, just take a moment to think about that. What other drug has more often than not outperformed all different kinds of pharmaceuticals and all different kinds of trials for all different kinds of maladies, right? The placebo. Um, and so what that points to, at least in part, is the power of our own consciousness, the power of our own mind. And so I really like to encourage people, whatever you're doing, why don't you leverage that? Why don't you leverage the power of your own consciousness? If you take a supplement for brain health or any kind of health, think to yourself how great that is, how wonderful that is, how good it is that you get to take that. You can leverage that power of belief uh, to your advantage. So I just wanted to share that with you all. And there's another thing that I find myself working with my own clients with all the time, and that is our drum roll again, our inner critic. Oh no. <laughs> and I've discovered through my own work, this probably isn't, you know, a huge shock to any of you listening, but our society has an epidemic of inner negativity. So many of us are so hard on ourselves, so self-critical, so down on ourselves all the time. And one of the things that I like to teach people is this kind of, I call it, sometimes I make a joke. I'm like, let's do a really advanced yoga pose together. You raise your hands up, stretch out your arms above your head, raise one hand up, and then bend your elbow and give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> and that you can do that internally, of course, so that, that inner pat on your back. So whenever you do something positive, it could be taking a supplement, it could be exercising, it could be going to sleep early, it could be having a good conversation with a friend, whatever it is, to take a moment and recognize that, it's a fact, it just happened, you just did that and then appreciate it and see that you're doing something good, you're doing something helpful for yourself, for other people. And that moment of recognition and appreciation and patting yourself on the back is an antidote to that inner critic that's constantly beating, our, beating us up, that's constantly telling ourselves we're not good enough, that we're a failure or that we're not doing enough or that we don't have enough time or whatever that inner critic is for you, find ways to antidote that. As cheesy as it sounds, if you do that repeatedly, if you develop new mental habits, it can make a tremendous difference that will, of course, improve not only your mental health, but your physical health as well. Like Dr. Love talks about one of the best ways to improve your sleep at night, which is, in my understanding, sleep is probably the most fundamental thing in terms of our health um, in so many ways, good quality sleep. One of the things, one of the best ways to improve your sleep at night is to, as you fall asleep or getting ready to fall asleep, have a positive anticipation for tomorrow. Look forward to something good about your day tomorrow. That'll help you sleep better. <laughs> so, without further ado, I bring you the great, powerful Dr. Love. Back 
back on the podcast. Robert. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, by the way, do you want me to look at you or do you want me to look at the camera? What's going to be most helpful? Like, yeah, you can uh, either way, actually. Okay. So I like to I like to tend to look towards my guests. Okay, great. I'll, 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 I'll face this way. Audience, yeah. hello. I love you. <laughs> yeah. It's, so it's, it's honored to be back. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, you were on the podcast. We did made our conversation the two episodes um, about two years ago. And you've done a lot since then, but you're still studying brain health, still helping people with that. Do you want to share what you've been up to? Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with me, my name is Robert Love. I'm a neuroscientist, and I specialize in helping people prevent Alzheimer's disease with science. And uh, most of my work is education-based. I try to share a lot of information online to help people take steps to prevent Alzheimer's disease, slow down aging. And then there are even things people can do to reverse memory loss. Um, if they've been diagnosed with early stage Alzheimer's disease. And so I'm really trying to give people the science, give people hope. And then for people our age, so I'm 40, I'm 41. You just turned 40. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome to the 40 Club. Yeah. I want I want people to understand what they can do right now to optimize their brain health and and stay healthy as long as possible. I'd like to live to be 120 in good health. Yeah. And I want to give other people the information that I have so that they can live to be however long they however old they'd like to be in good health. I was just on, so we're in Boulder, Colorado. On my way here, this is fascinating. This yeah. person's on chat GPT on their phone and they said, "How do I make really clean crystal meth?" And I paused <laughs> and I thought, "You heard someone say that?" Yes, they said this just as I was passing by. I stopped and said, "Excuse me, sir. I just want to let you know human to human, I think it's a really bad idea to do anything with crystal meth." And I said, "I support your right to put in your body whatever it is you want to put in your body. Uh-huh. If you want to take crystal meth by all means, I just, I'd like you to live a happy, healthy life. And I don't think that's going to help. And so I said, look, I just, I want you to be healthy, but by all means do whatever you want to do, but I just don't think that's a good idea. And he's like, oh, thank you. And so I, I said, blessings to you. And then I, I walked on. Thank you. It's a very uh, polite method. Yeah. <laughs> or meth, yeah, he, meth. He, he, well, so if we, if we dive in there a little bit more, first of all, I mean, it may sound obvious, but I'm curious your take on why we've had to take meth and then two, if we were honest, so many people in this country are taking meth. They're taking Adderall, they're taking Vivian, yeah. they're taking prescription methamphetamines. Of course, if you say the word meth or crystal meth, it has tremendously negative connotations. Yeah. I apologize to everyone I offended by using the word meth head. But um, <laughs> it's just the reality that methamphetamines are part of our life. They're in our water. They're everywhere. So can you Wait, are you apologizing to all the meth heads or the people who aren't <laughs> taking meth who are offended? Right? If you don't take <laughs> meth and you're offended by the term meth head, I don't, does that work? I don't know. I don't know if we're. There's if, a lot of there's a lot of very sensitive people. If people, people who there, don't so take <laughs> meth, are they allowed to be offended at the term method? I don't know how the offense mechanism works. <laughs> I try not to be offended by kind of anything. But if if you don't take meth, do you have a right to be offended if someone uses the term meth head? Yeah. I, I don't know. I kind of wanted I, to it's just that's a question for people to consider. Like, who has the right to be offended? Because in my experience, this is going to offend some people. I've noticed a lot of white women who have lived very, I'd say, privileged lives. I've lived an exceptionally privileged life. My parents are, are have paid for really high levels of education for me. Mm-hmm. They get offended at things of groups that they're not a part of, mm. whether, it's, whether it's race or religion or some sort of membership group. They're like, I'm offended when you say that. I'm like, well, you're not a member of that group. Do you have a right to be offended about that? I don't know. All right, that's a little side conversation. It, that is. But uh-huh. I think this is an interesting to ponder because people are so quick to be offended today. <laughs> like, well, I'm not talking about you. If you don't want me to say that in front of you, that's fine. But I don't know if the offense mechanism is right to be triggered in you as, I'll say, a white man. Yeah. Like, as a white man, can I be upset about something that's about a different ethnic minority group and a different religion? I'm a, I'm a white, I was raised white Christian. Mm. I don't know. I can say I don't like that, but can I be offended by that? So anyway, meth. What? <laughs> Why is meth not good? So first of all, differentiate between meth and Adderall, Ritalin, Vyvanse, Concerta. So I have ADHD. I've been prescribed ADHD drugs for most of my life. ADHD drugs are amphetamine. They're amphetamine. They mimic amphetamine uh, in the brain. In the brain, they increase dopamine, norepinephrine, and they can increase adrenaline. Um, they last a long time, so they're not very. They're not extremely addictive, but they're pretty addictive. They're not nearly as addictive as cocaine and meth. Be fair to say they're dependency forming. They can be for sure. Now, meth is different. Meth hits faster and harder than amphetamine. Methamphetamine is different. Mm -hmm. Interesting side note, I don't know if you know this, in World War II, the German Blitzkrieg, which was um, the Nazis, they moved really, really quickly. They went to France faster than France had could possibly imagine. How'd they do this? 
drugs. <laughs> they gave their um, their uh, the tank drivers. They gave them what they called Panzer chocolate or Panzer chocolat. So yeah. so tank chocolate, which was methamphetamine. Yeah. They, they the well, Germans yeah. literally gave their soldiers the, yeah. methamphetamine. Why? This makes it um, first of all you can stay up all night. Then you can. Um, it's a lot easier to kill someone if you're on meth. It desensitizes mm -hmm. you, right? So that's kind of what you want in a killing machine, which is, you know, people in the army at the time. The dark, that's, dark that's, history. That's what they were. Interesting side note, the UK gave their pilots amphetamine. Huh. So think about the Germans gave their soldiers meth. The British gave their pilots amphetamine, closer to Ritalin, Adderall, cl closer to Adderall, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a distinction between meth and amphetamine. I just want to be clear. Yeah, it's a good distinction. But they're very, they're related. They're they're, similar. They're, they both increase dopamine and norepinephrine. Meth is much more addictive, much more dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, much... I, I, I mean, it's really steer away from that. It's going to hit you a lot faster and, and a yeah. lot harder. But generally speaking, it, it, so it's a good idea, I think, to stay away from things that aren't sustainable as far as my long-term health. So drinking alcohol every night, I found is not sustainable for my long-term health. I right. don't feel this good the next day. Right. Um, if people are doing substances, whether it's a lot of sugar, alcohol, uh, whether they're doing Adderall, uh, whether they're taking, please don't take drugs, you're not prescribed or whether they're doing harder drugs like, like meth or cocaine, if you don't feel good the next day, that doesn't seem really sustainable. That doesn't seem like a good idea if you want to live a long, healthy life. So I do things that are sustainable um, and taking these substances that we don't feel good the next day, whether it's a lot of sugar, alcohol, whether you're smoking a pack a day or, or whether you're taking illicit drugs. By the way, I think you should have the right to put in your body whatever you want. I don't think the government should regulate what it is that we can do as sovereign individuals, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's a good idea. And so if you want to take meth, it, I think that's your right to do that. It's not legal, but that's your right. But I don't think that's a good idea if you want to be healthy. Yeah. I mean, I guess technically it's not your right, in, according to the laws of the United States. But I take your point. I agree with it. If, you know, if we're educated, it can make good choices for ourselves. But it's complicated. Right? It's interesting how the laws change based on public opinion. Yeah. So before, cannabis or marijuana was illegal everywhere in the right. United States. Now... We're in Boulder, Colorado. It is flat out legal. It is legal recreationally for adults 21 years and older. Right. Now, it's not legal federally, but it's legal statewide. Yeah. And so our rights, quote unquote, rights changed based upon <clears throat> public opinion. Our generation feels that cannabis should be legal. People are coming around to understand the science that it's really not that dangerous and addictive. I'm not saying it's good for you, um, but this idea of what is our right yeah. as, as humans, yeah. right? That That's changing now based upon our ability to communicate with our government and elected representatives saying, we, we think we can do this and this, this should be our right. So I highly recommend you vote in your local and state elections to make sure people represent you effectively and represent um, your interests, specifically if you have an interest of, of individual right and sovereignty and you know, it's your right to, to choose to put in your body whatever you want as long as you're not harming others. I don't, right. think, I don't think you have a right to drink yeah. and drive, but yeah. you know, if you want to... I kind of want to get your two cents, like if we problematize that a little bit, because I, in general, agree with you. And I think... And I hope we're moving towards a society where there's more freedom of choice, where there's better education and knowledge yeah. out there, because we want to be able to, I just see a future where everyone can make their own decisions more and more. And, but to do that, we really need to have access to high quality information. I totally agree. I know you're looking at the science and studies, but to problematize it a little bit, we don't have to go too far down this rabbit hole, but if we have a society where everyone can choose what they take into their body yeah. based on the decisions that they're going to make, we've got things like sports. Performance enhancing drugs. Yeah. We also have things like that can enhance our cognitive abilities, which yeah. I know you want to talk about, which is really I, awesome. But I took some earlier today. I'm, 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 just, I'm there. Imagine a society where there are drugs that could help someone do way better on something like, say, the SAT, but they cost a lot of money. Yeah. And then we have this economic demand. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. And then in terms of longevity, I know a lot of people are excited about that, but there is concern that it will be available to the 1%, not available to everyone. Absolutely. And what and kind of world is that going to create if we have? Effectively, 1% of the population that are kind of superhumans based on what they can afford. You know it's, what I'm saying? It's so, totally fair. So uh, just yeah. to put, just to lay my cards on the table, I'm very fortunate because I understand the science of optimizing the brain as well as optimizing the physical body, and I can afford these treatments. So I recently got, went to Mexico. I got a stem cell treatment. I got an anti-aging treatment here in Colorado. Um, I took supplements today that I know are really good for the brain that not everyone can afford. Most people don't even know about these supplements. So I have a tremendous advantage compared to most other humans, not counting the fact that I'm a white male in a society that white men have, generally speaking, have an advantage. 
That's a huge advantage. I come from a wealthy family. They paid for a really good education. I have all these advantages stacked up right. in my favor, which is just not, quote unquote, not fair on, a, on an equal playing field. Um, but if people have knowledge that others don't, that's certainly a competitive advantage. And if they take supplements or drugs that enhance their performance, that's certainly an advantage. So I'm trying to share those supplements, substances, and practices, mm -hmm. behaviors especially, to try to level the playing field so everyone has access. I think most important is, is good food. If you're not eating good food, how on earth are you going to compete, mm -hmm. right? So people who eat processed food, that's so harmful to your brain. Please don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're eating foods, phrases, pesticides, that's bad for your long-term health. That's bad for your brain. If you're eating foods with glyphosate, glyphosate's a neurotoxin. That's probably really bad. Mm -hmm. If you're drinking unfiltered water, there's probably fluoride in it. That's not good for your brain. There's all these things that um, people don't know about that they're doing that are harmful to their health. And then it's really unfortunate. Uh, people of color in the United States really don't have, a lot of them live in, quote, food deserts where they don't have access to healthy food. They have access to convenience stores. And so they eat food or at convenience food. stores yeah. or fast food, yeah. right? I would say that food is legitimately poison. It increases their risk of death over time from chronic disease because it increases the risk of type 2 diabetes, um, heart disease, and eventually stroke, obesity, all these, all these problems, right? So I think it starts at the fundamental level of access to clean foods. So I'd love to make sure that everyone in the United States has access to yeah, healthy, important. organic, priced food. Then once we get the food level, food playing field even out and the water even out, so p people in Flint, Michigan, they drink water that's dangerous to them still. It's like been 10 years. Oh, really? And neither the, the Michigan government nor the federal government <clears throat> have been helpful to people of Flint, Michigan. It's that's terrible. an embarrassment. We're the richest country in the world. We can't figure out how to clean the water in Flint, Michigan or move those people. It's like, hey, if you live in Flint, Michigan, here's $10,000 to move to a different city so you don't need to drink this toxic water. Right? We haven't figured that probably out. probably need more than 10000 Whatever it is, let's figure that out and save those humans. Yeah. Um, so I would want to lay, layer, lay, excuse me, even out that playing field first, the food and the water, before we talk about the superhuman supplements, right? Because people often are like, oh, I want to take this drug because it makes me you know, superhuman. Okay, but if you're eating processed food or if you're not sleeping well, uh -huh. that's probably the biggest one. If you're not sleeping yeah. well, that's the biggest harm to your brain and to your optimal health. That's interesting. Yeah, there's so many factors that are related. If we look at it at the nervous system level, even if you're trying to, and this is more, you know, I work as a therapist, mental health, somatic, trauma therapy, psychedelic therapy, but if someone's um, making a real effort to eat well, sleep well, exercise, that's awesome. And if, yeah. if their nervous system is in a constant state of fight or flight and they yeah. have a lot of stress and they don't feel safe on a fundamental nervous system level, then that's a huge long-term health problem that's going to cause a lot of issues. They're not going to be able to receive the benefits from Absolutely. Their, their other efforts. So yeah, I, I interviewed an expert yesterday, Dr. Jabin Moore, about, um, about this. So I didn't know this. A lot of people who are doing the healthy things, eating the healthy foods, drinking plenty of water, maybe even practicing meditation, getting sleep, some of them still have that constant anxiety yeah. or uh, fight or flight response. He said to look at for mold toxin toxicity. So get tested for mold. Hmm. So that's often a lingering toxin in our environment that is so harmful to us that our brain is saying, hey, be afraid. Something's happening that's harmful to you. And then once you remove the mold from the environment and then from the brain, then the brain can calm down because mm -hmm. it's no longer being attacked by 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 mold, which is that's, unfortunately a lot more prevalent. That's interesting. Isn't yeah. that isn't that wild? I think um, yeah, there's a lot of factors here. One thing that I um, kind of counsel to use that word a lot of people around is to do the best we can do to take in the information to make changes, you know, to improve our health for the better benefit, you know, the better, but to to try not to stress out about it, right? Obviously, absolutely. So like, like if we can, like I have some people I work with who. Have a hard time falling asleep and then they get into this loop of i know i should get about eight hours a night and now the clock's ticking i'm not falling asleep and it, it creates this anxiety and stress that you know because it can come from putting pressure on yourself to try to be healthier and so we, we need to find ways to yeah align ourselves be healthier and try to take the stress and pressure off and so like a good tip that i've given a lot of people is try to get the right amount of sleep for you on average over a week and don't stress about getting it every night. That's a good tip. I can take the pressure off. Oh, yeah. Oh, every night I have to get eight hours. It's like, no, maybe yeah. tonight I just got six, but maybe tomorrow I'll get 10. Yeah. And then, yeah. I just thought um, pressure people feel in marriage or in relationships about, about sexual performance. Oh, yeah. So as we age, um, it's found that a lot of men experience trouble having erections, but a lot of that's mental. Like if you can get across the mental barrier, right. that the pressure to perform 
it gets, it gets actually gets a lot better. And so saying, listen, we don't need to have sex tonight. Let's take the pressure off. Let's have it sometime this week when we're feeling, hopefully it's more than once a week. Yeah. Uh, interesting side note, those who, uh, men who have sex two to three times a week with their, their spouse have a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. Amazing. And the same can be true for women, but it has That's to so be. interesting. Yeah, There's it has real, to be. Real health benefits. Absolutely. To an active, healthy sex life. Sex is also beneficial to women, but they, they don't need to initiate it, but they really need to be, um, they need to be into it. Sometimes women engage in sex, especially if they're married or in a monogamous relationship that, they, that they're committed to. They feel the obligation to have sex. That sex is much less beneficial than when the woman initiates it or mm-hmm. when the woman is like, I guess, really into it. Mm-hmm. Right. When she's like, oh, yeah, I want to have sex versus, oh, my partner wants to. I'll, I'll be available for that. There's, there's a difference there. And so the more women uh, initiate sex and the more women are really into it, the healthier it is for them as well. And I find that I mean, my guess is the more men enjoy it. I think I, the more the, the female partners into, into sex, Absolutely. the more enjoyable yeah. it is for both partners. Yeah, it's so important. So it's something to strive for, <laughs> not only for enjoyment, but also for health benefits. Yeah. Can you really get to slow down to make it less goal oriented? Yeah. Less, you know. Exactly. I know. In the moment with them. Yeah. Um, and so can I give some of my favorite sleep tips? Yeah, please. So I learned this from. Uh, Dr. Matthew Walker on the Tim Ferriss podcast. Dr. Matthew Walker is a neuroscientist who wrote a book about sleep. And so here's what he shared. He said the number one barrier to sleep, as most people can guess, is stress. Right. And so here's things you could, two things you can do within five minutes before bed. It doesn't need to be right before bed, but closer to bed, the better, uh, to help reduce stress and improve, uh, improve your sleep quality. So number one is to get those things out of our head that are looping in our head. Sometimes right. yeah. I'll be thinking, oh, I need to do this thing in my business or, or I really want to do this. And so it's important that I write that down mm-hmm. before bed so I'm not thinking about it as yeah, I'm right, sleeping. Writing down can be able to externalize it and take exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. So whatever is looping in your mind and or whatever is stressing you. So, hey, I have a pro- challenge at work with this coworker. I'm going to deal with that tomorrow. So mm-hmm. write down problem or stressor when you're going to deal with it. You can say I'm going to deal with them tomorrow. Uh, by the way, don't have relationship conversations right before bed. They're mm-hmm. rarely resolved. It yeah. usually makes the problem worse. Yeah. And uh, That's a good tip. Yeah. Like you, if it's a relationship problem, relationships are important. Schedule that at a time when you're most mentally and emotionally available to have a difficult conversation, which is when you're well rested, when you're in a good mood and when you can focus. It's not, I'm tired and I had a long day at work and I'm trying to go to bed and my partner's upset. Let's work this out. No, 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 no. Bad idea. Do it when you're fresh. Do it after you've had your coffee in the morning. You feel really good. Say, honey, I love you. Our relationship is important. Let's take this next hour and work out the challenge that is upsetting both of us right now. Let's work this out and you have have my full attention. That's a way better way than trying to solve it later. It can be good to calendar. It can be good to schedule. Yeah, calendar. Depending on how you and your partner work. But another tip I can just throw in there real quick. Yeah. Don't have uh, relationship conversations while you're driving. Oh, my gosh. Because you're, you're not making eye contact. You need to be paying attention to the road. Driving is inherently stressful, actually, and your life is actually at risk. On some level, our nervous system knows that. Yeah. And so I've seen a lot of couples that have a lot of conflicts, and it comes up when they're driving. Yes. So um, and table that, it. <laughs> that's a great great idea. And then I learned this. Gosh, what was her name? Uh, someone who, who, who talks about uh, relationships between men and women. She's great. I'm sorry. I forget her name. She said, don't talk to men as they're before they get on the highway or as they're getting off. So when, so when we're making a yeah. decision, men really need to, I'm not saying women don't, but in particular, men do best focusing on getting off the highway and getting on the highway and the time leading up to that. Once we're on the highway and we're cruising like this, we can talk. Oh, yeah. But asking me a question as I'm like trying to merge, bad idea. <laughs> right? Because I'm, I'm trying to navigate these things yeah. and it's really important that I focus on the road. So ask yeah. me the hard questions or don't expect me to respond until I'm on the highway and we're just like cruising. So... Um, Give your partner space to get on the highway or get on the straight road before asking them a question because we're trying to figure out the, the short roads. Yeah, yeah. Um, so other tips for uh, sleep. So number one, write down your stressor or things that are looping in your mind, and that can take a minute, right? Challenge at work, coworker, deal with it tomorrow when I see them at 10 a.m. Mm-hmm. Or, or, see, or with my partner, or I'm going to address that challenge in my business, whatever it is. Number two, one of the biggest determinants of sleep quality is positive expectation of tomorrow positive expectation of tomorrow. How do we have a positive expectation of tomorrow? We think about all the wonderful things that are gonna happen. That's great, that's a good one, yeah. So write down minimum three things you're looking forward to doing tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So write down things that are in your mind or stressors that are, that are in your mind when you're gonna deal with them. Then number two, 
what you're looking forward to tomorrow. I've done it as simple as I'm looking forward to my breakfast. I love my breakfast. There you go. Put that down. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this breakfast. Oh. It's going to be good. I'm looking forward to walking first thing in the morning in the sunshine. By the way, I recommend walking. Great thing for sleep. Being in the sunshine as soon as you wake up, mm. that helps set your circadian rhythm. It's also just a great ritual. And I find that I am also more grateful and I exercise, excuse me, I engage in a lot more prayer and gratitude during those my 10, 20 minute walk in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so I highly recommend walking outside first thing in the morning without sunglasses. Andrew Huberman, neuroscientist at Stanford, talks about many benefits of that. So write down three things you're looking forward to. It so could that, be that one. That one you just shared is reminds me of gratitude practice, which I recommend a lot of people do before sleep. Yeah, so it's kind of a similar thing, but it's positive expectation and tomorrow. I love yes, that. gratitude is great. Totally. Yeah. Um, this is a little bit more specific of what you're looking forward to. So it might be gratitude for the future. I'm looking forward to tomorrow because I get to do this great podcast with Julian. Um, I get to see, uh, I get to go to my friend's birthday party tomorrow and um, I, I'm going to enjoy my breakfast today. <laughs> Exciting. So simple. So simple. Yeah. And, and, and there you go. And now I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. If you're dreading tomorrow, how's your sleep going to be? Yeah. Goodness gracious. That sounds awful. Yeah, so, it's, it's interesting. I learned this uh, from a Buddhist teacher a long time ago, and I think it's starting to show up more in neuroscience and these studies around sleep, but the, the state of mind you have as you fall asleep is a good chance it will carry forward throughout the whole night and, yeah, have a better sleep. If you can fall asleep in a compassionate, grateful, positive state of mind, yeah. however you can get there um, as you fall asleep, it's definitely Absolutely. worth your time. Yeah. One thing for couples, hugging an embrace is so valuable. That's why I love being here in Boulder. Last night we were, we were hanging out and a mutual friend came in. He gave me a great hug and I just melted his arms. I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so good. Great hugs can change your neurochemistry. They can change your hormones. They can increase oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone, the love hormone. Most of us are chronically deprived of touch and certainly of long hugs. And so if, if you, uh, are in a, in a relationship and you sleep with that person in the same room or even in the same house, engage in a 30 second to a 60 second embrace before bed. That'll help regulate your nervous system. It'll bring down the stress. It'll bring up the gratitude. It'll bring up the oxytocin. Way easier to fall asleep. And you get to have a really loving experience before you go to bed. And it's free. You know, no one's, very few people are promoting hugs. I don't know any business that is directly promoting hugs because there's no money in them. Right. But there's so there's so much benefit in them. There's so much benefit in a hug. They are free. They are so good for your health and well-being, yeah, and they yeah, feel well good. Goodness gracious, please, 30 to 60 seconds, like mm -hmm. like two deep breaths together as you're embracing. You can massage each other if you like. Yeah. I love the boulder massage hug, right? <laughs> That'll be a thing. The boulder massage hug. It's so great. You, you just as squeeze you it. Like, oh, my gosh. So please get your hugs in. It's free medicine. It's medicine from, from God, the creator of the universe, whoever made us in our biology. You yeah. know, this, this is a free uh, free hormones is, is a hug with someone someone you love. I wonder if a similar benefit can happen from spending time with a pet, especially dogs. And I have a I always have my dog Sailor here, and she'll cuddle with people when they come in, and it's helping. It's at least helping regulate the nervous system. It feels good. I don't know about the oxytocin part, but I imagine there's some some connection there. Yeah, there's tremendous benefit with pets. Um, one is a, is from the physical benefit, right? We love touching pets, and pets love to be touched. Yeah. So we get some some of that contact. Pets also have us exercise, so we're more likely to be outside. Mm -hmm. Pets, people who are alone and are not married or not in a, they don't live with a partner, that gives them some responsibility. Mm -hmm. So if, if you are uh, don't have children and you're not married, having a pet is super duper helpful because you don't feel alone. And you also feel some responsibility for another uh, being. Yeah. That feels really good. So all kinds of benefits of, of, of pets. I think dogs in particular, but... Um, because I think there's an exercise component with dogs that's not there with cats. But if you have a pet that you love, amazing for your health. Yeah, I love that. Hmm. Well, great. Thanks for all this. I know we have limited time today. Do you want to give us, because I know it's a specialty of yours, around some of the supplements, around some of the brain science? Yeah, what would be most helpful to your audience? So I got supplements for sleep, supplements for optimal brain health, supplements for, for health Generally speaking, stuff they probably have never heard of that it's really interesting. <laughs> stuff that I've said on my TikTok channel that's got me in a lot of trouble. It's really interesting. <laughs> I'm happy to share that stuff. Um, what, what, what are some of the things that would be most helpful to your uh, I guess, listening I guess audience? What, what I'm interested in, like you said, longevity, sustainability, long-term health. Okay. Um, yeah, and general things that we can take yeah, to increase cognitive health, well-being, 
Okay. Dementia. But then, yeah, anything you want to share around that? I'm gonna, uh, first, let me give you the one that's got me in trouble. Yeah. Sure that's the one. most interesting. I learned about this from Dave Asprey, and I've been taking this. It's actually a former prescription drug. It's available in the United States without a prescription. In the UK, it is a prescription drug. Um, and this I've been using, I think, for at least, I think probably closer to six years on and off. Excuse me. It's called aniracetam. Anaracetam. You, you've given me some before. I, I have. Yeah. What, what were your thoughts? Yeah, it felt good. I felt some more alertness, but I didn't, you know, it wasn't a huge, it was a little subtle, right? Yeah. yeah. So aniracetam, spelled A-N-I-R-A-C-E-T-A-M. What this does, it has a number of different benefits. Um, we believe it increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. This is a growth factor in the brain that promotes a healthy brain, also facilitates the growth of new brain cells and new neural connections. By the way, if you didn't know this already, Adults, even into their 90s, can grow new brain cells. Research from Dr. Elizabeth Gould at Princeton University, she's published in, in the journal Science and Nature, two of the top journals on how mammals can grow new brain cells. All mammals except bats, for some reason. But uh, we can grow, grow new brain cells in the hippocampus, the memory center of our brain. So if you want new brain cells, you want it in the memory center, I think, because yeah. we want new memories. Uh, so we can do that. BDNF helps do that. Exercise is actually the best way to get BDNF. And so the very best, quote, supplement, for brain health is by far exercise. See, that's such a great message to share. And so, yeah. So if you're not exercising, you're missing the vast majority of benefits. Like exercise beats any supplement day in, day out, hands down. Um, so I took Ritalin and Adderall in high school and college. Exercise, way more beneficial for my ability to think and learn and study than, than Ritalin and Adderall by far. You know, yeah, and that, that reminds me, I listened to this podcast interview with this guy who wrote a book interviewing Nobel Prize winners you know, in science, and he was surprised and kind of shocked at how devoted they were to their hour-long walk or their time in the gym or swimming or tennis. Like, they all had some exercise that they, they just kind of intuitively realized, you know, because these are people that are now in their 70s, yeah. 80s, 90s, so they didn't have the, they didn't have as many people like you when they were growing up telling them exercise is good for the brain, but yeah. they, it figured that out naturally, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, so wow, I think I, I think so much better when I get my exercise. I think better, yeah. And so people want to know, what's the minimum amount for the maximum benefits? And that's a good <laughs> question, generally speaking. How much broccoli do I need to eat get the maximum benefit of broccoli, right? Um, so gen generally, the amount of exercise you want is 20 to 30 minutes a day of aerobic exercise that gets the blood pumping, gets fresh blood to the brain. Your, your brain is only three pounds, but uses 20 to 30% of your glucose and your oxygen. So that gets fresh blood. So could that 23 minutes be a good walk? Or does if, it need to be more that, of a run? If that gets your heart rate up. Okay. Walking 30 minutes, great idea for all kinds of reasons. And if you want the maximum benefit, your heart's got to get get up. So start with walking, and then you can move into something more aerobic. We'll get to the what the very best exercise is for longevity in just a minute. Interestingly, it's not jogging or swimming, which was surprising to me. Huh. Um, so 20, 30 minutes for, for the brain. And then... Uh, Several times a week, three to four times a week is best, but if you can do two, that's good, is resistance training, weight training. Now, I know you've been into this recently. Um, yeah, you're, looking, yeah. you're looking very fit these days. <laughs> so resistance training helps build muscle and maintain muscle. And as we age, people can undergo something called sarcopenia. That's the loss of muscle mass, similar to osteopenia, which is osteopenia, which is the loss of bone mass. Mm -hmm. People are familiar with that. But old, as we get older, it's easier to lose muscle. So you want to maintain muscle as we age, because we don't want to become frail. So make sure you're doing resistance training as well. Resistance training is also exceptionally valuable for um, helping, helping with uh, insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, because muscle consumes um, glucose. Hmm. And so if you have plenty of muscle, that can consume glucose and help prevent high sugar levels in the blood. Hmm. So all kinds of benefits of resistance training as well. So exercise, amazing for the brain and amazing for, for growing new brain cells. Um, so so back to aniracetam. So aniracetam helps increase BDNF. I don't know if it directly increases uh, new brain cells. That hasn't been studied. Aniracetam also increases something called acetylcholine. Mm. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter involved in memory, also involved in motor movement. This is, this is my motor movement. <laughs> Very fancy here. Acetylcholine involved in a lot of different processes in the brain, but specifically memory. It's involved in focus, memory, and attention. So it increases that. And then a lot of these anti-Alzheimer's drugs or these drugs for people with Alzheimer's, a lot of them work by increasing acetylcholine. So it's got a similar thing. But here's what's really interesting. And this is what so, I got in trouble so for. Are you taking acetylcholine or that's increased by the aniracetam? 
Aniracetam increases acetylcholine activity. How exactly it does that is not quite clear. Okay, it's not clear if it mimics acetylcholine or if it increases the release of uh -huh. acetylcholine or if it increases or if it stimulates acetylcholine receptors through some third mechanism. Mm -hmm. That's not clear. I don't, I, I don't know what that is, but it is clear yeah. that it does increase um, cholinergic activity yeah. or acetylcholine activity. Um, so what do you get in trouble for? Right. So I shared this study. <laughs> Amazing. A bunch of academics got mad at me for sharing the scientific study. So why? Because they didn't know about it. And they, they kind of look silly if they, if they don't know about it. So this is uh, published research um, in the Journal of European Psychopharmacology. I think that's the name of the journal. It's definitely got European and psychopharmacology in it. And this is a study in Italy. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled study of people with Alzheimer's disease in Italy. And what they found, so, so these people were diagnosed, took a memory test. Hmm. Half got a placebo, half got aniracetam. They followed them over six months. Mm -hmm. So people with Alzheimer's disease, let's say they started with their memory here and they measured them throughout the study. By the end of six months, their memory was lower, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. They have a neurodegenerative disease. Their memory is expected to do worse. The aniracetam group, same starting point. It went down, it leveled off, and then it went up. So by the end of the study, their memory is actually higher. It was mm -hmm. better than when it started. Beautiful. So yeah. these people with Alzheimer's disease, over six months, their memory got better mm -hmm. on aniracetam. Fascinating. Guess who's talking about this? The only person I know of is Dave Asprey. It's in his books. You're talking about it. And, then, and, I, and I'm talking about it, and I'm getting in trouble for Wait, it. Why is that? It's like aniracetam has a bad name. Who's making money from this? Huh. I'll tell you who's not making money from this. The, the big companies that are in this business. Is aniracetam an older drug that they can Aniracetam is, you can't patent aniracetam. Okay, yeah. Um, and so you can buy it right now online uh, in the United States. Other countries, you can get a prescription drug. If you're in Europe, ask your, do you ask your doctor to see if it's safe for you. Um, but it's not safe for everyone. So please consult your medical doctor before do anything that affects your health, including taking any of the supplements or any of the things I described. You're responsible for your health, not me. I'm just sharing with you the science and my understanding of it and then what I'm doing. So aniracetam... Um, a, a lot of doctors in the United States, they don't know about it. And so they'll tell patients not to take it, um, but they just don't understand it. And so it's good to have a doctor who actually look at the literature and be like, oh, wow, this improved memory in, in, in patients with Alzheimer's. This is interesting. Yeah. And so what happens is uh, it, it's this interesting psychological effect. I'll show someone the data. I'll show this to my dad. I said, dad, look at this published research. And he's like, wow, this is phenomenal. And by the end of the paper, he's like, wow, if that's true, then everyone would be doing this. I said, yes, if everyone knew about it and understood it. The challenge is when people hear about this, they have that reaction and they dismiss it. Mm -hmm. So if I show you this great data saying, if you take this thing, this will massively improve your memory and reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. If you said, well, that's true, everyone would be doing it. Yes, if they understood it mm -hmm. and, like, ha and, and had a go ahead from their doctor. The challenge is most people don't believe it because no one's talking about it, that's interesting. right? So yeah. do your research on Aniracetam. Look it up, read some papers, watch some videos. I got some videos that are up that, that, that talk about Let's, it. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. What's one more thing you'd recommend? I, I, so, an, so another great one is um, curcumin. Curcumin helps reduce the accumulation of plaque in the brain. Plaque is associated with Alzheimer's disease. Curcumin, 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day with black pepper is amazing. Um, extremely safe. Also helps reduce inflammation. Protects against um, uh, the dangers of obesity. Magnesium. Seven out of 10 Americans are deficient in magnesium. Mm -hmm. And so a magnesium supplement can be really helpful. Uh, 320 milligrams for women, 420 for men is the recommended dose for the government. You can probably go higher than that. I recommend magnesium glycinate. That's an inexpensive, highly absorbable form of magnesium. Don't do magnesium citrate or oxide. Those can cause disaster pants. That's another Dave Asprey <laughs> phase. Um, that can hurt your stomach and leave. Say the one you recommend again. Magnesium glycinate. Glycinate, yeah. Uh, you can do magnesium threonate. That, that crosses into the brain. It's a lot more expensive. I'd start with glycinate. Mm. Another great one, one of my favorites is lion's mane. Full disclosure, I have a lion's mane supplement. Um, mm. Lion's mane has so many benefits for the brain. It increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, like exercise, helps grow new brain cells, new neural connections. Lion's mane, um, it's a medicinal mushroom that is used in ancient Chinese and Japanese medicine. It reduces depression, anxiety, stress, and it's really helping me with my sleep. Anything that helps you with your sleep is great for your brain. Write that down. Anything that's good for your sleep is good for your brain. That's why exercise is so good for your brain. Morning sunshine, reducing stress, those hugs before bed, those journaling, all those are good for your brain because they help with your sleep. 
Um, so Lion's Mane helps people fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, fall back to sleep. It improves energy production, good for the immune system. So I love that one. And then fish oil and a B complex. Mm. Research from Dr. David Smith at Oxford found that those who take a fish oil supplement and a B complex, you need both. Huh. And don't just take B12. You want all the Bs. You want B5, B6, B9. The whole B complex plus a really good fish oil, about 1,000 milligrams or more of DHA per day. So don't just take the dose on the bottle, 1,000 milligrams of DHA per day, check with your doctor first, of course. And this helps reduce the risk of Alzheimer's by 30%. 30% That's of these incredible. two supplements, and these are great for your overall health as well. Amazing, love that. So I'll run over those really quickly again. Aniracetam, by the way, take that with some fat, that increases absorption. Curcumin, take that with some fat and black pepper, that increases absorption. Magnesium, magnesium glycinate. A lion's mane or a mushroom blend. Mine is a lion's mane mushroom blend. And um, what, was the, what was the last one we just did? Well, fish oil and bee complex. Yeah. Yeah. So those are some great supplements for the brain. Really healthy for most healthy adults. Love it. Well, thanks so much for being back on the podcast. Thank you for having me. This is so much fun. Yeah, I'll have to be back on again. Thanks, Thank you.